It does this with these two off-center rings on the drive shaft. The one on the right pulls the claw backwards and forwards, the other one makes it go up and down. So both combined give the four motions. This completes the basic mechanism, all four movements connected to a single drive shaft. This is actually a toy made in Germany about 1893. It's called the Nuremberg Lady or Nuremberg Princess. It's patented. The cotton goes in here, that's the bobbin. It comes through a tensioning system. It comes across to here, the needle would have been held in her hand. You see her head nods. Although it is a toy, it has all the mechanical characteristics of an ordinary sewing machine. I've been collecting sewing machines for about 15 years, and about three years ago a few of us got together and decided to form a society to pass on information and share information and find out what was going on. And it is now an international sewing machine collector society, which we show on Toysmax, and we have members all through the world, America, Australia, Hong Kong, all throughout Europe, and uh, I just brought along one or two of my machines to show the very different types that are available. These come, that comes from France, Germany, those are America, this is Glasgow, and that one's from Coventry, an English-made machine. And every one is slightly different the way it developed. Well, a very unusual machine is uh, this little one here. Unlike the rest of the machines, this isn't painted or brightly coloured. It's nickel-plated, looking a bit like a giant stapler. Very nice noise, a bit like a puffer train. Now, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why this machine should have hands. No reason apart from being pretty. Why somebody should do it, I don't know. It was made in Coventry by a man called Stardy, and his trademark was Lady Godiva on a horse the lion, the beast. Uh, it was made by a Glasgow company called Kimball & Morton about 1863-ish. As a sewing machine, it's quite ordinary. It's just a shuttle mechanism. It's just unusual because of its shape. Now, this is a French machine. It's called La Populaire, and it's certainly a very popular machine among collectors. Although it's called... Um, it works on an average system. We always call it a pusher. And it is one of the very few to use this unusual push-start mechanism. But we've seen all these very different looking, very complicated, very simple mechanism machines. But one of the simplest, one of the prettiest, one of the most popular, and probably, in my opinion, one of the best. The Wilcots and Gibbs. The early machines were all beautifully decorated. I think this was because the sewing machine was the first machine to enter the home. At the time, all other machines were industrial. Lavish decoration was an attempt to make them look more domesticated. At first, the different manufacturers' machines had very distinct characteristics. But by the 20th century, they'd all started looking more and more alike. This was partly due to the commercial dominance of one particular manufacturer. Oh, John, I'm so discouraged. How can I ask anybody to this house the way the furniture looks? Well, it is pretty awful, but I don't suppose we could buy much with our money. Not unless a miracle happens. Ah, uh, there's the miracle. Hurry, 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 hurry. Answer that doorbell. That's the first time I ever saw a miracle in a two-pants suit. But it's the Stinger Man. He'll send her to the nearest Stinger Sewing Center, and the Miracle Man turns her over to that Miracle Woman, the sewing teacher, to you. Just a few simple lessons on the sewing machine, and her house will look so attractive they'll probably sell it at a profit. 
Now let's take a look at the finished room with the rest of the girls she's invited over. You don't mean to tell me these draperies, curtains, and slip covers yourself. How did you ever make them so perfectly? It's a grand color scheme. They must have cost a pretty penny. Only $18.31. What? Why, I wish I could sew like that. But you can, Martha. What's that? The address of the nearest Singer Sewing Center. Get it? The company was founded by a man called Isaac Merritt Singer. Although Singer was trained as a mechanic, his real love was the theatre. Julie, I've always loved you, honey. Can you ever forgive me? Oh, this is Whoa. so sudden. Oh, Homer. In 1839, he managed to sell a design for a mechanical excavator for $2,000. Power gets to the bucket, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll buy it. And with the money, he set up his own theatre company called the Merritt Players. Oh, I'm rich. I'm rich. Now I can start my theatre company. Sting him up. Oh, oh no. goddamn no. hell, I will. Oh. Hey. Oh. Oh. See, oh. honey, I told you I'd save you. Oh, Julie. My hero. Singer's theatre company went bankrupt after a few years. Then, in 1851, he came across an early, unreliable sewing machine. I could do better than this. He built his prototype in only 11 days and then went into production. Singer's machine wasn't particularly original, but he was brilliant at selling it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this machine sewing before your very eyes. Here is your trousers, Isaac. Proves they're going to work. Yep. In partnership with a sober lawyer called Clark, he started the first ever hire purchase scheme. By 1867, Singer was a very rich man with a total of 18 children from a variety of wives and mistresses. But because the machines were being sold to respectable homes, Clark then persuaded Singer to leave the country. It's a one-way ticket. Oh. You gotta leave town. No? Singer eventually settled in Torquay, where he died in 1875, <laughs> leaving a total of 24 children. <laughs> In the earliest days of the sewing machine, attempts were made to find a better way of powering it than just turning a handle. In America, the treadle caught on immediately, because it was a great advantage having both hands free to control the cloth. But in Britain, it was regarded with great suspicion for many years. It was generally thought to be unladylike and rather harmful for the ankles. Attempts were made to power the machines by water wheels, giant clockwork motors and steam, but all were inconvenient. The first electric machines appeared in the 1920s. At first the motor was a separate lump bolted on. Only very gradually did it become integrated in the body of the machine. The motor itself is connected by a drive belt. This belt used to be rubber or leather, but on modern machines, um, there's a synthetic toothed belt, which has the big advantage that it doesn't slip. They've now replaced belts, gears, and chains on many machines, like photocopiers. They're quieter, easier to set up, and don't need oiling. 